Hey guys, welcome back to Sorky Forum Sip. My name is Samantha. What I'm fixing to show you may be very disturbing to some of you. I ask that you listen to me all the way through because this is 100% true. It is not fake. There is a book written about Baron Trump and his dad is the last president of the Republic of the United States. Hello everyone. Welcome back to Sarky Formstead. There was a rumor going around that there had been a book written about a young boy named Baron Trump, whose dad becomes the last president of the United States, the Republic of the United States. This book was reported to have been written sometime in the 1800s. So as usual, me, Samantha, went digging. Not only did I find the book, I bought the book. I bought the book. And today we're gonna to deep dive for the first time into this book. I can tell you what I found out about the author, whose name was Ingersoll Lockwood. From everything I found, yes, he was a Christian. Yes, he had a lot of work in government, everywhere from embassies to even being over a prison at one point. Now I will share more about the Arthur further into the video. So you're not gonna wanna turn it off guys, cause this is all very important. The reason I find this interesting is because President Trump's son is named Barron. And we have all heard rumors, prophecies, and words given by people saying that President Trump will legitimately be America, the Republic, the United States of America, the Constitutional Republic's very last president, right? I mean, if you're a Christian, if you're living in this day and age, you've heard somebody say that. So to have found a book that was published on this date over a hundred and almost 30 years ago, talking about the last president of the United States in a trilogy with a young boy named Baron Trump, well, I couldn't pass it up. Now, whether you believe a time traveler wrote this, a demon, or somebody filled with the Holy Spirit, the fact is the book was written. And right now, together, I'm gonna read some excerpts out of it, not much, because I believe if you wanna read it, you need to purchase it. But I'm gonna read some of the good stuff for you guys. Get ready, sit back, get something to drink, tell her ready to go away and give mom and dad a few minutes, because folks, this is amazing. Now I'm going to read for you some sections of this book because I think these are very important. Throughout the length and the breadth of the South and beyond the great divide, the news struck every hamlet and village like the glad tidings of a new evangel, almost as potent for human happiness as the heavenly message of 2000 years ago. Bells rang, out in joyful acclaim and the very stars trembled at the telling and the telling over and over of what had been done for the poor man by his brethren of the north. And around the blazing pine knot of the southern cabin and in front of the mining camps of the far west, the cry went up, silver is king, silver is king. Black palms and white were clasped in that strange love feast and the dark skinned grandchild no longer felt the sting of the lash on his sire's shoulder. All was peace and goodwill, for the people were at last victorious over their enemies who had taxed and tied them into a very living death. Now the laborer would not only be worthy of his hire, but it would be paid to him in a people's dollar for the people's good, and now the rich man's coffers would be made to yield up their ill-gotten gain. And the sun would look upon this broad and fair land and find no man without a market for the product of his labors. Henceforth, the rich man should, and was right and proper, pay a royal sum for the privilege of his happiness and take the nation's taxes on his broad shoulders where they belong. Motley armies marched upon the capital of the Republic, the railway trains, night and day brought vast crowds of new men, politicians of low degree, Men out of employment, drunken and disgruntled mechanics. Former's sons to seek their fortunes under the reign of the people. Healers and hangers-on of ward bosses. Old men who had not tasted office 
for 30 years or more, all inspired by Mr. Bryan's declaration that the American people are not in favor of life tenure in the civil service, that a permanent office holding class is not in harmony with our institutions, that a fixed term in appointed offices would open the public service to a large number of citizens without impairing its efficiency. All bearing news in their hands or across their shoulders, each and every one of them supremely confident that in the distribution of the spoils, something would surely fall to his share since they were the common people who were so dear to Mr. Bryan and who had made him president in the very face of prodigious opposition of the rich men whose coffers had been thrown wide open all to no purpose. And in spite too of the satanic and truly devilish power of that hell upon earth known as Wall Street, which had sweated gold in vain in its desperate efforts to fasten the chains of trust and the claws of soulless monsters known as corporation upon these very common people soon to march in triumph before the silver chariot of the young conqueror from the West. The inaugural address was not a disappointment to those who had come to hear it. It was like the man who delivered it, bold, outspoken, unmistakable in its terms, promising much, impatient of precedent, reckless of result, a double confirmation that this was to be the reign of the common people. That much should be unmade and much made over. And no matter how the rich man might cry out in anger or amazement, the nation must march on to the fulfillment of a higher and nobler mission than the impoverishment and degradation of the millions for the enrichment and elevation of the few. Then he threw himself into a chair and seizing a sheet of official paper, penned the following order and directed its immediate promulgation. Executive Mansion, Washington, D.C., March 4th, 1897, Executive Order Number 1. In order that there may, may be immediate relief in the terrible financial depression now weighing upon our beloved country, consequent upon and resulting from the unlawful combination of capitalist and money lenders both in this republic and in England, and that the ruinous and inevitable progress toward a universal gold standard may be stayed, the president orders and directs the immediate abandonment of the so-called gold reserve, and that on and after the promulgation of this order, the gold and silver standard of the Constitution be resumed and strictly maintained in all the business transactions of this government. It was two o'clock in the afternoon when the news of this now world famous executive order was flashed into the great banking centers of the country. Its effect in Wall Street beggars description. On the floor of the stock exchange, men yelled and shrieked like painted savages and in their mad struggles tore and trampled each other. Many dropped in fainting fits or fell exhausted from their wild and senseless efforts to say what none would listen to. Ashen paler crept over the faces of some while the blood threatened to burst the swollen arteries that spread in purple network over their brows of others. When silence came at last, it was silence broken by sobs and groans. Some wept while others stood dumbstruck as if it was all a bad dream and they were awaiting the return of their poor distraught senses to set them right again. Ambulance were hastily summoned and fainting and exhausted forms were borne through the hushed and whispering masses wedged into Wall Street. To be whirled away uptown to their residences, there to come into full possession of their senses, only to cry out in their anguish that ruin, black ruin, stared them in the face if this news from Washington should prove true. So he's basically saying in this book that the first executive order of this president in, in this book, right? would be to actually back the United States dollar with gold or silver, making it an actual weighted currency, ending the new world order going over to a digital currency. Because our paper, it, money's worthless. It's not backed by anything anymore. Could you imagine if Trump did this? What Wall Street, what happened there? Could you imagine how quickly the rich would lose their wealth let that sink in, folks. The first act to pass both houses and receive the signature of the president 
was an act repealing the Act of 1873 and opening the mint of the United States to the free coinage of silver at the ratio of 16 to 1 with gold and establishing branch mint in the cities of Denver, Omaha, Chicago, Kansas, Kansas City, Spokane, Los Angeles, Charleston, and Mobile. The announcement that reparation had thus been made to the people for the crime of 1873 was received with loud cheering on the floors and in the galleries of both houses. And the great North heard these cheers and trembled. We are the people, wrote the president. We the people, says my shirt, right? So, it's so cool, guys. And then it goes on to say, when a Republican member of the House arose to move the usual adjournment for the holidays, there was a storm of hisses and cries of no, no, said the leader of the House amid deafening plaudits. We are the servants of the people. Our work is not yet complete. There must be no play for us while coal barons stand with their feet on the ashes of the poor man's hearthstones and weeds and thorns cumber the fields of the farmer for lack of money to buy seed and implements. There must be no play for us while ra railway magnets press from the pockets of the laboring man six and eight percent return on thrice watered stocks. And the landlords, enriched by inheritance, grind the faces of the poor. There must be no play for us while enemies of humankind are by means of trust in combination and corners, engaged in drawing their unholy millions from the very lifeblood of the nation, paralyzing its best efforts and setting the blight of intemperance and indifference upon it by making life but one long struggle for existence and indifference upon it by making life by making life but one long struggle for existence without a gleam of rest and comfort in old age. No, Mr. Speaker, we must not adjourn, but by our efforts in these halls of legislation, let the nation know that we are at work for its emancipation. And by these means, let the monopolist and the money changers be brought to a realizing sense that the reign of the common people has really been entered upon. And then the bells will ring out happier, gladder new year that has ever dawned upon this Republic. So I want you to think about our elderly right now, how I showed you guys the other day that they have cut food stamps in the state of Hawaii. Yeah, they have reduced American citizens food stamps and, and of all places, Hawaii, right? Now, I want you to hear this last little bit and then my best advice to you is get this book, friend. The opposition fairly quailed before the vigor and earnestness of this new disposition, of this new dispensation. They were soon before the house and pressed well on toward final passage a number of important measures calculated to awaken an intense feeling of enthusiasm among the working classes. Among these was an act establishing a loan commission for the loaning of certain monies of the United States to farmers and planters without interest. What? An act for the establishment of a permanent Department of Public Works. It's had to be styled Secretary of Public Works, rank as a cabinet officer and supervise the expenditure of all public monies for the construction of public buildings and the improvement of rivers and harbors. An act making it a felony, felony punishable with imprisonment for life for any citizen or combination of citizens to enter into a, any trust or agreement to siphle, suppress, or in any way interfere with full, open, and fair competition in trade and manufacturing among the states. You guys, I would vote for any president. That would do just a little bit I've talked about. Look, we're gonna keep going, but it's time for me to feed my husband. It's been a long day and it's my third video today, guys. I love you. Let me tell you something. If the Holy Spirit has been telling you to do something, whether it's write a book, write a poem, open up a YouTube, start a garden, get out of debt, marry your girlfriend, whatever it is, friend, obedience is better than sacrifice. This gentleman wrote this book. He didn't know that in 2024, a Southeast Louisiana woman 
would be sitting in her home, her home on September 18th, 2024, reading it to 51,000 people. He didn't know that a young man named Barron Trump's daddy would be running for president of the United States. He didn't know any of that, but he had a download for a story from the Holy Spirit. Think about that, the things that make you go, hmm. Enjoy this next quick clip about who the author is and a little bit about this book. Love you guys, don't forget, make sure you're still subscribed. Needs. Lockwood had established a parallel career as a lecturer and writer. It was common for authors of the time to publish pamphlets and then go on the circuit advertising their thoughts from these pamphlets. In 1884, Lockwood married Winifred Wallace Tinker, a Pennsylvania native and graduate of Vassar College who was born in 1862 and was 21 years his junior. At this time, Ingersoll Lockwood decided to emulate the success of children's books by Lewis Carroll and J.M. Barrie and produce the Baron Trump novels. These are two children's novels written in 1889 and 1893. They remained obscure until 2017 when they received media attention for perceived similarities between their protagonist and U.S. President Donald Trump. Lockwood published the first novel, Travels and Adventures of Little Baron Trump and His Wonderful Dog, Bulger, in 1889, and its sequel, Baron Trump's Marvelous Underground Journey, in 1893. The novels recount the adventures of the German boy, Wilhelm Heinrich Sebastian von Trump, a similarly long name to Baron Franz von der Trink, who was one of the heroes Lockwood admired, who goes by Baron Trump as he discovers weird underground civilizations, offends the natives, flees from entanglements with local women, and repeats the pattern until arriving at Castle Trump, which is on Fifth Avenue in New York City. An 1891 reviewer wrote about one of Lockwood's novels, the author labors through 300 pages of fantastic and grotesque narrative, now and then striking a spark of wit, but the sparks emit little light and no warmth, and one has to fumble for the story. Lockwood's writing style was what much better suited to political fanfare, and his work 1900 or The Last President is exciting and well written. Baron Trump lives in a building named after himself, Castle Trump, while the real life Donald Trump had lived in Trump Tower on Fifth Avenue for decades. Furthermore, Donald Trump's youngest son's name is Baron Trump. The Trump family immigrated to the United States from Germany in the 1890s and started speculating in real estate in Seattle in 1891. Before 1918, they had begun to purchase real estate in Queens. The last name Trump would not have been an uncommon one for Longwood to use, and the first name Baron harks back to respected Austrian hero Baron Trink, which Longwood would have known due to his tenure as ambassador to a German kingdom.